So I think, oh, just a minute, yeah. So we'd like to begin. Well, Murray, just before we begin, can I yeah, please. set the OBA yeah. for this unit? We're just going to have one essay for this one. Just find my page, sorry. Okay, the OBA is question number one. Okay. On page 85 of your handbook, which is with reference to Bhagavad Gita, chapter 14, verses and purports discussed in your own words, ways you are personally influenced by the modes of passion and ignorance, and practical ways you can develop the mode of goodness. That's going to be your only OBA for this one. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Okay. The personal application question. So. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu, uh, is there's the last date for submission of this uh, essay? Is there anything set like that due? Yes, there will be. Um, actually, just hold on. Sunday the 7th. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I can begin? Yes, please, Maharaj. Thank you. <clears throat> Om Magyana Timurandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militan Yena Tesmai Shri Gurve Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschatya Desha Tarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So we are continuing Bhakti Shastri study of Bhagavad Gita. So this, this morning we have to finish complete chapter 13 and also go into chapter 14. Hopefully we can complete chapter 14 today also. So just to review what we covered yesterday, we heard about knowledge the process of knowledge. Everyone remembers what was the most important item in the process of knowledge? Yes, Prabhu? Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, constantly, constantly uh, doing and allowing the portion of service. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, right. Most important. So, we spoke about the process of knowledge and then we went on and spoke about gyam, the object of knowledge. The object of knowledge or the noble. And that, that was introducing, we were learning about who, about what? What, was, what is gyam, the object of knowledge? Yes, someone, some other person? Of soul and super soul. Yes, right. Thank you. Yes. So we heard about the soul and the super soul and the relationship between the two. And then we went on to discuss about Prakriti and Purush. 
Prakriti, the material nature, and the Purusha, the living entity, and the relationship between the two. And we heard about how Prakriti is also eternal. As the living entity is eternal, Prakriti is also eternal. Sometimes manifested and sometimes not manifested. Just like clouds. Sometimes appear in the sky, sometimes there, sometimes not. So then we were on the final section of the 13th chapter, which is Jnana Chakshus, or the vision of one in knowledge. All right, we're on verse number, I think we're on verse number 30. Okay, we've completed 30. So we can go on to verse number 31. In verse number 30, we were hearing how the body is like a machine designed by the Lord. We should see our bodies like that. It's a machine. Remember, and we should see others like that. Okay, going ahead, text number 31. Describing the vision of one in knowledge. Would someone like to read the verse? Madhijis can read. Let's have a Madhiji read. Can I read Maharaj? Yes. Yes. Yada, yada. No, no, just, just, just read the English. Yeah, yes, the translation. Okay, Maharaj. When a sensible man ceases to see different identities due to different material bodies and he sees how beings are expanded everywhere, he attains to the Brahman conception. Thank you. Okay, so the Brahman conception. You, like, you can see, the, the man see, we, the one in knowledge will see all the different bodies as different, as simply expansions. They're simply, what, what are they? They're, sees different identities due to different bodies. He sees how beings are expanded everywhere. So what is the point Krishna is making? That everyone is Brahman, that all the different living entities are all different forms of Brahman and they're in different bodies. As Prabhupada explains in the purport, in the material conception of life, we find someone a demigod, someone a human being, a dog, a cat, etc. This is material vision, not actual vision. Right? So actual vision is to see the spiritual nature of every living entity. This is the point. And Prabhupada said, when one can see this, then he attains spiritual vision thus being freed from differentiation. So this is the idea. Not to be bewildered by the material energy. Go ahead, text number 32. Marijis, let's have each Mataji read first. Text 32. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead. Text 33. Text 33, translation. The sky, due to its subtle nature, does not mix with anything, although it is all pervading. Similarly, the soul is Brahman vision, does not mix with the body through 
So Krishna is giving an, an analogy here for all of us to understand. He's comparing the soul within the body to the air. Although the soul is in the body, it doesn't mix with the body. And to support this, Krishna gives it he, an analogy. He says, just like the sky does not mix with anything. And in the purport, Prabhupada describes, he, he says, the air enters into water, mud, stool, and whatever else is there. And still it does not mix with anything. Similarly, the living entity, though situated in varieties of bodies, is aloof from them due to his subtle nature. Therefore, it is impossible to see with material eyes how the living entity is in contact with this body and how he is out of it after the destruction of the body. No one in science can ascertain this. So this is a nice analogy given by Lord Krishna. Just like the air doesn't mix with anything, in the same way the soul does not mix with anything. So Prabhupada says, he says you, therefore we cannot see the soul. We can't see it with our eyes, we, but we can see it with the eye of knowledge. And then there's another example coming in the next verse, text 34. Can we have another marriage read? Uh, yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Shri As the sun alone illuminates all this universe, so does the living entity, one with, within the body, illuminate the entire body by consciousness. So the analogy, the sun illuminates all the universe in the same way the soul gives consciousness throughout the whole body. So two analogies, very nice, one verse after another, Krishna helping to make it easier for us to understand this teaching. We'll go ahead, text 35, Mariji. Those who see with the eyes of knowledge the difference between the body and the knower of the body and can also understand the process of the liberation from bondage in material nature attain to the supreme goal. Alright, so this is the final verse of the chapter. Krishna is concluding the teaching, describing to us the, the, the power of the eyes of knowledge that we can attain the supreme goal. We can get freed from material bondage by developing this kind of vision. And Prabhupada writes about this in the, in the purport also in the beginning. The purport of this thirteenth chapter is that one should know the distinction between the body, the owner of the body and the super soul. One should recognize the process of liberation as described in verses 8 through 12 then one can go on to the supreme destination. All right, are there any questions before we go on to chapter 14? Is there anything important you would want, want to ask before we begin chapter 14? Anyone? No hands up. <clears throat> okay, so just to review the chapter, verses 6 to 7 were describing the Shetra, and then we had Gyan, verses 8 to 12, and then we had Gyam, the object of knowledge, 13 to 19, and then Purusha and Prakriti was described in verses 20 to 24, and now consciousness or the, the vision of one in knowledge is described from verse 27 to the end of the chapter. We're going to go on to chapter 14, the three modes of material nature. 
we would like to invite a man can be read for us the first verse The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Again I shall declare to you this Supreme Wisdom, the best of all knowledge, knowing which all the sages have attained the Supreme Perfection. Alright, we're very lucky in your student handbook you can see how each chapter is listed and we have the breakdown of the chapter. The first nine verses are describing conditioning of the modes. And then Text 10 to 18, we'll hear about the characteristics, action, and death in the modes. And then the final section, how we can transcend the modes. So, Krishna is just introducing the topic. He's not told us anything yet, but the first two verses, Krishna is just giving us an introduction to the topic. And in the purport, Prabhupada writes, he says, uh, at the end of the purport, he said, This knowledge is far, far superior to all other processes of knowledge thus far explained. That's interesting, isn't it? This knowledge is far, far superior to all other processes of knowledge thus far explained. How can we understand this? Anyone like to comment on this? How do you understand this? Karuna Sindhu Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, we saw in Bhagavad Gita, I think third or fourth uh, chapter that um, once who knows about what who knows about the last where it resides, he can tackle it nicely. So if you know about him also material nature, so, so that will behave in such a way to we already we, we already had chapter 9 Raja Vidya the king of knowledge and then the most confidential knowledge but we, I feel that because we are conditioned so how to come out of this condition that thing is discussed here so that will be helpful for us yeah it's just it's described for us that when when Prabhupada mentions this this knowledge because Krishna himself has also said about this knowledge again I the supreme wisdom the best of all knowledge so what what's the idea the best of all knowledge he already gave Rajavidya and the most confidential knowledge now he's saying the best of all knowledge it's the best of all knowledge in terms of the relationship between the jiva and the prakriti, the material nature. It's not the best of all knowledge in terms of devotional service, but it's the best of knowledge in terms of relationship between the living entity and material nature, their interaction. That's how we understand it. All right? Now, also, earlier in the purport, the first verse, it stated, if one understands this chapter through the process of philosophical speculation, he will come to an understanding of devotional service. Now, sometimes people are puzzled by this. They think, why is Prabhupada telling us to speculate? because we're often taught not to speculate. So how can we understand this philosophical speculation? Anyone can comment? Any hands up? Uh, 
yes maharaj hari krishna maharaj so according to my understanding maharaj uh, prabhupada is telling to uh, analyze and uh, philosophically understand it better like uh, uh, like with your mind and intelligence understand it by uh, like prabhupada used to say devils advocate so try to understand it in that way not like the gyanis way but uh, try to more about question these topics more deeper and try to philosophically understand it Yes, but how to philosophically understand it? Mm, by maybe deeply studying it more deeply, these topics? Yes, definitely we need to be guided by Sadhu, Shastra and Guru, by their teachings, philosophical yes. speculation. We want to understand more deeply the message of the Sadhus and the Shastra and the Gurus. Actually what happened, there was one young boy in England, he was the son of a devotee family, it was very early on, 1970s, and Indian family in, living in London, and uh, the, young, the young son had read the Bhagavad Gita and he'd read about this philosophical speculation. So he wrote to Prabhupada and asked Prabhupada about this that why are you saying speculate? You often criticize people to speculate. We say the impersonalists, the Mayavadis, they speculate. Now you, here you're telling us to speculate. So Prabhupada was very pleased, he liked the question and he said, very nice. And he said, but Prabhupada explained the meaning of philosophical speculation, that one must be guided by the conclusions of Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. Not that we would just speculate wildly by the power of our own mind. Hmm. And Prabhupada gave an example, he said, just like Krishna says, I am the taste in water, we should understand how it is that Krishna is the taste in water, philosophically. <laughs> okay, so there's a nice quote actually that Prabhupada's letter to that boy is there, and if you look in your book of quotes, you can read the very ex quite a, a quite a big quote from Srila Prabhupada's letter, which he wrote back to the young boy. And that young man, that boy, now he's a, of course now he's grown up, he's an older man, but he's still a devotee. Okay, just to read a little bit more from the purport here. Prabhupada said, it has also been explained that it is due to association with the modes of nature that the living entity is entangled in this material world. Now in this chapter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead explains what those modes of nature are, how they act, how they bind, and how they give liberation. The knowledge explained in this chapter is proclaimed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead to be superior to the knowledge given so far in other chapters. All right, we'll go ahead, text number two. Wait, question, can I ask Maharaj? Yes. Yes, you can hear you. Go ahead. Maharaj, as you mentioned about the speculation about uh, the best on the Sadhu Guru and Shastra, so Maharaj, can you elaborate reading by giving some example? So, so we may not went wrong, go wrong. Well, you read Prabhupada's letter. You read the quote. Read what Prabhupada says, that will be the best thing for you to do. You have the book of quotes, you have all the quotes. And so you look at that, it's given there in the quotes. And Prabhupada explains very clearly what he wants. I'm not going to present something different from what Prabhupada, you just read what Prabhupada says, that you will understand very clear, clearly. Okay, we'll go ahead. Someone read text number two. Uh, 
Krishna Madhuri Madhuri. <clears throat> By becoming fixed in this knowledge, one can attain to the transcendental nature like my own. Thus established, one is not born at the time of the creation or disturbed at the time of dissolution. Would you like to comment on this verse? Understand the translation, Maharaj. Okay, you don't understand. Well, what is what is Krishna saying? If we he said by becoming fixed in this knowledge, you can attain the transcendental nature. We can get a spiritual body. Krishna is telling us the benefit of understanding this knowledge, becoming fixed in this knowledge. This established, we're not born at the time of creation or disturbed at the time of dissolution. Oh, no, we get liberation, you know. We, this, this is Krishna is just giving us the benefit of this knowledge. All right, we'll go ahead. Te text number three. Um, Dhamadavina Bhavana Prabhu. The total material substance called Brahman, source of birth, and it is that Brahman that impregnates, making possible the birth of all living beings, O Son of Bharata. All right, Prabhupada explains this verse for us, the very first sentence. He said, this is an explanation of the world. Everything that takes place is due to the combination of Shitra and Shitragna, the body and the spirit soul. Right? So then Prabhupada goes into a detailed description about something about the creation and the Mahatattva and the modes of nature and then how the living entities appear. And then in the, in the second paragraph, then Prabhupada gives an interesting example. He gives up, he, he introduces us to this logic. Right? There are many different examples, logical examples. And this one is about the scorpion laying eggs. So it's important for us to be familiar with these kind of analogies. Sometimes we may be asked, what is this? Or we may be able to use it ourselves in preaching. All right, so... Uh, the scorpion lays its eggs in piles of rice. And sometimes, sometimes it is said that the scorpion is born out of rice. But the rice is not the cause of the scorpion. Actually, the eggs were laid by the mother. Similarly, material nature is not the cause of the birth of the living entity. The seed is given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead and they only seem to come out as pro products of material nature. And so this is a good logical example to explain that life does not come from chemicals. It comes from life, comes from God, an important principle. So Prabhupada was, of course, often preaching in, uh, in these things. So uh, we want to be able to use them sometimes in our presentation. Thus every living entity, according to his past activities, has a different body created by this material nature so the entity can enjoy or suffer according to his past deeds. The Lord is the cause of all the manifestations of living entities in this world. All right, so we'll go ahead now. Next, text number four, an important verse. I think, is it one of your memorization verses? Um, not this one, no. No? Okay. Anyway, we'll, we'll read the verse. 
Someone can read for me, please? Um, Domya Tal Prabhu. Translation. It should be understood that all species of life, O son of Kunti, are made possible by birth in this material nature, and that I am the seed giving father. Okay, thank you. So we have an exercise for you on this, on this verse. We want you to think about how you can apply this verse to all the different social, moral, scientific or theological situations which this verse could address. You know, in the course of our presenting our philosophy, we may deal with these different issues, social, moral, scientific, theological. This verse can be applied in many different situations. We would like you to, maybe we can put you in groups of three or so. Can we do that, Prabhu? Yes, we can, yeah. Give them a little group work. Okay. How many groups will we have? Oh, we'd have quite a few groups. If they were in threes, we'd have about 12 groups. Oh, that's a lot. So it, should we do it in groups of, say, five to six participants? Be better, yeah, be better, groups, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm creating the groups now. Please join your rooms now. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Is it, are you all clear what you have to do? No, Maharaja, I'm not clear. <laughs> Is anybody, does anyone understand what you have to do? We want to know how you can apply this verse in preaching work, in different social or moral or philosophical or theological situations. Read the verse and think about it, right? Okay, and think how it addresses different issues in the world today. Different issues which we are often put in, we have to preach in. And how can you apply it? Which particular issues could you use this verse to support Krishna conscious philosophy? Maharaj, like uh, if, we, if we say the social issues, uh, <clears throat> that as like Shri Prabhupada always mentioned that uh, United Nations, that uh, Krishna consciousness is actually uh, United Nations because people all over the world are, uh, you know, they, they get together and uh, under one flag of uh, Krishna. Can that be for social? Yes. Yes, that's good. Like that. <clears throat> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, regarding the moral issue, Maharaj, so uh, uh, everybody thinks that, especially the people who eat meat, they think that uh, only humans' ha has life is precious. But Krishna says here that He is the Father of everyone and all living entities, and He is the seed giving Father. So all life is precious, and if one values the sacredness of life, then one will actually appreciate every form of life. Yes. Very good, yes. Right. Yes, you've got the idea. Right. So go on like this. Come up with some different arguments. I'll just go to another room and see. Thank you. 
philosophical standpoint. Oh, are you in room two? You could think about. So, this for Sham Sunder, but come on. Hare Krishna Prabhus. Hare Krishna Prabhus. Have you got some, uh, have you come up with some, could argue, some uh, points for this exercise? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Actually, Maharaj, sorry for that. We we didn't understand question completely. Could we please repeat it once again? For All right. We, I want when you look at the verse and read the verse and think how we can use it in presenting our Krishna conscious philosophy in different situations, in different social maybe some social conflict or some moral issue, philosophical, the scientific issue. You know, just like we were speaking about life coming from life. So how will we present that to, to the public? You know, just a minute. How, how will you, you know, that life comes from life? So scientists, you know, they don't accept that. They're trying to make life from chemicals, so we can use our Krishna conscious philosophy to argue against it. So using this verse, using this particular verse, which particular aspects, philosophical issues can we, can, could you use it? Okay, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much. Krishna says, for example, Vaham Bija Pradapita, I'm the seed giving father. Who is he the father of? Do you understand the point? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. In this purport, Srila Prabhupada explains to us Yes. Yes. You can tell something, Prabhu. Uh, from uh, what left? Social. Yeah, morally, yeah, any point, Prabhu, any point, if you have any point, Prabhu. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I thought that the uh, personal point of view that because Krishna is the supreme or original father of all living entities. So we are all the, the son of Krishna and son of God. Uh, so we should uh, cooperate to all. Just like Bhagavad Kumar Prabhu said also, we also can...
Well. <laughs> so we're almost all back, Maharaj. Okay, good. Yes, it's just, time. Just, just, a, just about <laughs> half a minute, I think. All right. Okay, so everybody's back now, and we had six groups, and I visited group two and four. I visited, I visited group one and six, I think. Okay, all right, so maybe then we could start with group five. <laughs> Is that okay? Yes. Good. All right, okay. So, group five then. Well, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. <laughs> Hare Krishna, go ahead. Uh, you visited our group, Maharaj. Oh, I visited. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so, I could, uh, our group could raise just one point in this regard. Like, like different communities, uh, let it be different countries, different people, Indians, Pakistanis, and etc. etc. So they all fight on the base of their birth. And as Krishna is stating here, that he is the father, he is the seed giving father. So I think these kind of social issues or political issues, uh, I think this, <laughs> I'm not sure whether it is correct or not. All right, I, I take your point that we see everyone as the children of God, right? Sons of God. Krishna is the father and we're always sons. So we shouldn't discriminate against each other on the basis of birth, color of skin or nationality. Is that your point? Yes, my Lord. Yes, my Lord. Okay, thank you. So that's one point. Let's take something from another group. We've got five, six groups. We'll hear from each group. We can take one point from each group. Okay, Raja Vidya Prabhu, you've got group, um, your group then? Oh, I was in group two. So okay. we have this point from the Prabhupada what you mentioned in the purport is that all these appearances are due to Mother Nature and Krishna's seed giving father. So if we go down to any Pain, the ultimate, like you, you take example, we discuss about example of uh, Big Bang Theory. They say that everything came up from an explosion. So that explosion also took, if you go deep into it, the source of it, ultimately it goes back to Krishna. So Krishna is the ultimate uh, father, seed giving father. Never. Also, this is scientific issues in, in, in presenting Krishna consciousness to a scientific community, you could, you would present to them that they, if they say the origin of life is the Big Bang, you could challenge them that who caused the bang? Yeah. Or where did the bang, how did the bang come about? Who was, who caused that? All right. People say life comes from chemicals, but Prabhupada would say, yeah, but where do the chemicals come from? Who put the chemicals there? So your point is that behind everything there's Krishna. Okay. Thank you. We'll hear another from another group. Um, Ananta Vilasa Prabhu, your group. Yes, yes Prabhu, thank you. So we are from group one. We cover the points which were not covered. So we discussed on the theoretic, uh, theological and philosophical point which covers in the last pa paragraph Prabhupada mentions the purport is that the material world is impregnated with living entities who come out in various form at the time of creation according to their past deeds. So this brings in two points for us. 
One is about the re point of reincarnation. People who don't believe in reincarnation, we can debate with them saying that we come in this world not by our free will, but we are by mother, mother, uh, mother nature's uh, mother nature provides us based on our past karma. It's, it's based on uh, our past misdeeds or past karma that we get different bodies. And whatever happens in our life is governed by this uh, karma or by the deeds that we do uh, in this life or the past life. So mm. that's one point. Okay, interesting. Well, then you want to present uh, the importance, present the, the theory of reincarnation to the materialistic people. Yes, Maharaj. And using this verse to support it. Yes, Maharaj. And your basis is that because different standards of life are there, but there's so, so many differences there. How can we explain it philosophically? Why somebody's born rich and someone's poor? Why some soul is in the dog body and some soul is in the demigod body? So we're each put into different situations and how can we understand how philosophically, you know, people, of course people don't like to think about these things, but the, Thoughtful people will want to know, they want to understand these issues and this, this verse can help us to understand. All right, thank you Prabhu. Another group? Um, Chaitanya Chandra Prasad's group. Chaitanya Chandra Prasad. I am from group 3, so we discussed, like uh, the scientists, they claim that the inkling that we are, you know, is, um, we are creating something based on intelligence, but who gives this intelligence? And what they are creating, the aeroplane, the software, the, whatever the, the modern communities, it basically comes from these five basic materials. Who created these five basic materials? So it comes from Krishna only. All right. Yes. Thank you. So similar point that everything comes from Krishna. The material nature is not independent. So certainly we can use Krishna conscious philosophy to inject spiritual knowledge into the scientific community. Do we have another group still? Um, yes, Maharaj, we do. Indulaka Kripa Mataji's group. Hare Krishna Maharaj, we are from group 6. We were discussing like that in uh, the whole universe or in the earth, whatever we say now, uh, we have different kinds of people, like uh, different, with different colors or different religion, whatever. But the bodily constitution is same. It's not only for human beings, it is only any other animal life or any other living entity. For example, Indians, we are having uh, one kind of body structure or uh, what to say, color or whatever. But uh, and Americans or any other people like uh, uh, Middle East or African, they are having the different color. But the thing is that the constitution of body is same. The body is made of uh, same uh, blood, pus, urine, whatever, and uh, even the, what to say, two eyes, nose, all those things. Similarly, any other, if you take dog species, they are, even though we have different varieties of dogs, but their constitution is same. So this way, uh, God has made us like this. All right. Thank you, Mariji. So developing spiritual vision, seeing everyone as part of our family, Part of one family, kidding. All right. Any other group? Um, you have brought two video people who wants to say something else. Yes. Yeah, Maharaj, we also discovered that uh, by understanding this uh, uh, philosophy, of understanding that Krishna is the seed-giving father, we can uh, 
we can have a peace formula in the material world also, in this world. Prabhupada had mentioned that. Very peace good. Formula. Yes, peace formula. By understanding properly the nature of life and the nature of the world, then we can live in peace and harmony instead of fighting like cats and dogs. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes? And Smriti Karuna Mataji. Yes? Maharaj, the point, the point that you made was that of those who eat the non-vegetarian food, and for them it was like on moral basis, we know that Krishna is the father of all, and all living entities are his children, and so we should not kill the other living entities. So what are you going to say if someone says to you, well, you eat vegetables, you kill the vegetables? But this is what uh, Krishna has mentioned that he accepts. But he never said that he accepts the, the, the food. He said, he said, but he never said that you kill other entities and you offer them to him. Okay. So you're ready to argue on that? <laughs> Okay, very good. Yes, we can also present uh, to evolutionists this, this verse. Evolutionists, of course, they're saying everything comes, but you know, man is evolved from the apes. It's a good verse to present to them. Of course, not everyone accepts the Bhagavad Gita, but still, it's nice to be able to relate to devotees that when we're confronted with the atheistic propaganda for these things like evolution and Darwin's theory and then you've got apartheid and so many other just, you know, materialistic philosophies. So we want to use our Krishna conscious philosophy to present and defeat these atheistic arguments. This is the idea. And theologically, people, uh, the, the, the Buddhists, they say nothing is real. Of course, Buddhists, they're atheists. Impersonalists, they're also atheists. Advaitists, there are so many atheistic philosophies. But we say, no, there's a God. There's a person behind. Life comes from God. It doesn't come from chemicals. We can give them all the chemicals they want. They cannot create any life. Okay, we'll go ahead. We're going into the next section. Uh, this first... Oh no, the, the first... Well, we're going into the... Hear about the modes of nature now. Beginning text number five. Someone can read the translation. Oh, Smriti Karuna Mataji, if you'd like to read the translation, please. Yes, Maharaj, I have a question and ask in the end here. Text five translation. The material nature consists of three modes goodness, passion, and ignorance. When the living entity, when the eternal living entity comes in contact with the nature, O oh mighty Amt Arjuna, he becomes conditioned by these modes. Right, the key word, nibbananti, right? Conditioned. Do condition. We become conditioned because we contact the three modes of nature. So we have to be very careful. Uh, Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, they are all induced to act according to that nature. This is the cause of the varieties of happiness and distress. Right? Due to our association with the material nature. We want to be very careful, try to keep away from this material nature. So we're going to study here and understand more about these modes of nature. We'll go ahead. Text number six. Let's go to Karuna Sindhu. Oh, sinless one, the mode of goodness being purer than the others is illuminating and it frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode becomes 
conditioned by a sense of happiness and knowledge. Right? When we go for book distribution, we have that tendency, we look for people in the mode of goodness. We think they'll be the best ones, but not always. In fact, often not. Why? Why, Why people in the mode of goodness are not interested in Krishna consciousness? Because they're so happy, they're already happy, they've already got knowledge, they've got their own philosophies. <laughs> they're difficult. All right? So Prabhupada in the purple talks about the mode of goodness and he explains the features of the mode of goodness, how people think, you know, they're a little advanced in knowledge, they have the sense of happiness, understanding the mode, the, you know, they're, 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 they're vegetarian, you know, they don't... <clears throat> They live maybe a kind of purer life than others. So because they're a bit better situated, not necessarily economically better off, but philosophically and culturally they're a bit better off. They think they're better than others. So this is the, the being in the mode of goodness does create some problems because they're, they're, they're happy, they're actually feeling comfortable being in the mode of goodness. Just like Prabhupada mentions, a typical example of someone in the mode of goodness, the Brahmana. And the Brahmana thinks, he's a Brahmana, he's better than others, right? And when there's, a, when there's prasadam, they should feed the Brahmanas first. And we give charity to the Brahmanas. And so the Brahmana think, I'm a Brahmana, I'm better, you know. <laughs> so this is a problem. So Prabhupada writes in the second paragraph, the difficulty here is that when a living entity is situated in the mode of goodness, it becomes conditioned to feel that he is advanced in knowledge, better than others. In this way he becomes conditioned. And then Prabhupada gives examples the scientist, the philosopher, they're both thinking, they know, they're thinking, they know about life, they have their philosophy, they have their own ideas, and they're happy about it. So this is very, this is a problem. You don't want, we don't want, we do want to cultivate the mode of goodness, but we don't want to be too much attached to just being in the mode of goodness. You have to use it to transcend. And Prabhupada explains there at the end of the purport, the problem. He says, repeatedly one may become a philosopher, a scientist or a poet and repeatedly become entangled in the same disadvantages of birth and death. In Srila Prabhupada's time, there was a very famous uh, sitar player, musician, played the sitar. His name was Ravi Shankar. There's another Ravi Shankar today. He's a spiritual teacher, spiritual leader. Not him. But this Ravi Shankar, he was a musician. He played sitar. He came and met Prabhupada, I remember, he came in London, I was in London when he came there. We had Janmashtami that day and Ravi Shankar came to the temple, he sat in the temple. Shamsundar recognized him and Shamsundar was Prabhupada's secretary, he took, he took Rav, Ravi Shankar up to meet Prabhupada. So uh, we, I heard that this Ravi Shankar, he'd taken birth as a sitar player like nine times birth after birth, playing the sitar. Each time, you know, playing better, better, improving a bit. So you, this is a problem. You could get in that kind of situation. You become attached to a situation, you know, to be a philosopher or to be a poet. It's from the previous life. And again and again you come. All right? So, 
be cautious. At the same time, we encourage, cultivate the mode of goodness. Okay, we'll go ahead, text number seven. Yes, go ahead, please. The, the mood of passion is born of unlimited desire and longing, O son of Kunti, and because of his, the embodied living entity is born in material creative action. So the mood of passion is very popular. You know, you see it advertised everywhere. Maybe they have a new car on the market and they, they will say, sit behind the wheel, feel the passion. When you put your foot on the gas, on the accelerator, feel the passion. You know, pa people are thinking, oh, passion, very nice, very good. So passion, you know, and people dress in a passionate way. Everything is passion. They don't realize the problem with passion. So Prabhupada explains to us the nature of passion in his purport. He says, the whole material world is more or less in the mode of passion. Modern civilization is considered to be advanced in the standard of the mode of passion. Formerly, the advanced condition was considered to be in the mode of goodness. That was before. People used to appreciate the mode of goodness. But not nowadays. People all want passion. I, w I, was, uh, I was in an airport, coming through an airport somewhere, I remember. I think it was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I noticed there was a, there was a restaurant and they had written on the window of the restaurant, taste the passion, <laughs> taste the passion, you know, passionate food, you know. Uh, people like that, you know. So this, this is the, the trend, this is the, in this, it's a, but formerly in the past, we appreciated the mode of goodness. Now it's become the mode of passion, which is popular. Everything's got to be passion. I want passion. They don't realize the problems which come with passion. All right, we'll go ahead, talk about next one, mode of ignorance, text eight. You want to read? Okay, you want to read? Text eight translation, O son of Bharata, know that the mode of darkness born of ignorance is delusion of all embodied living entity. The result of this mode are madness, indolence, and sleep, which bind the conditioned soul. All right. We said formerly people were in the mode of passion. Now, nowadays it's... Formerly the mode of goodness was attractive. Then it became the mode of passion. Gradually it will become more the mode of ignorance. This is the tendency that we may get more and more in the mode of darkness. So the mode of ignorance is the opposite of the mode of goodness. Goodness it was knowledge and happiness, but ignorance is just the opposite. All darkness and ignorance, it Prabhupada explains, or Krishna says, madness, sleep, indolence, like that. So, Still, Prabhupada writes in the purport, still people are madly accumulating money and working very hard all day and night, not caring for the eternal spirit. This is madness. You know, people don't realize they're mad, but Prabhupada understood they were mad. People used to say to the devotees, you're all crazy. But when, when they told Prabhupada that people are saying we're crazy, Prabhupada wrote an essay, who is crazy? And Prabhupada said, they're crazy. They're the crazy ones. 
because they work all, all working all day and night just to get money, just for their mating and defending. So this is mad. Okay, we'll go ahead. We're going to hear more about the most text number nine. O son of Bharata, the mood of goodness conditions what to happiness, passion conditions what to fruit of action, and ignorance covering one's knowledge binds one to madness. All right. We'll go ahead. Okay, Radha Vindam, please go ahead. Yeah. Translation. Sometimes the mode of goodness becomes prominent, defeating the mode of passion and ignorance. O son of Bharata, Sometimes the mode of passion defeats goodness and ignorance, and, and at other times, ignorance defeats goodness and passion. In this way, there is always competition for supremacy. So you can see the danger, that even you're in the mode of goodness, sometimes the mode of goodness will be defeated by passion and ignorance. Therefore, in Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada writes, therefore, one who is actually intent on advancing in Krishna consciousness has to transcend these three modes. So this is the important point we should learn from this. It's not enough just to be in the mode of goodness. All right, I think what we could do, we could go back to these groups and you could each summarize the different features how many groups did we have, Krishna Keshava? Uh, Maharaj, Krishna Keshava Prabhu has gone out. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have six groups, Maharaj. We have six, six groups. Okay, so group one and two can take the mode of goodness. Group three and four can take the mode of passion. And group five and six take the mode of ignorance. And we want each group to tell us the particular characteristics of this, that particular mode of nature and we want to know about what is the uh, destination for people who die in that mode and we want to know about uh, how, how they can uh, how they can, can compete, how they can, uh, what else is, are we told, how is it manifest? We want to know, give some examples, people in each mode, describe to us the people in each of the mode and tell us the particular characteristics of that mode and the destination when they die in that mode, like that. And we'll then we will uh, hear from each group rather than just go over it, reading it. Let you do, you do it yourself and we'll hear from each group. So, why do you want me to break out the rooms? Yes, go back into the rooms which we were in before. Okay, is everyone in the room? Uh, not yet. Not yet. 
everybody can join the room. Sri Garva Guru, please join. Muli Govind Prabhu, can you join, please? Uh, Chaitanya Chandra Prabhu. Uh, oh, it's not showing any room, Prabhu. It's not showing. Is it showing now? No, Praji, it's not showing in my okay. okay, if we can't do it, then we'll just continue as we were. If you're not able to do it, we'll just continue. We're up to text number 10. We're hearing about competition between the modes of nature. Text number 10. Oh, there's all the Krishna says. Uh, Maharaj, I guess maximum devotees have joined the group, but uh, we are not able to uh, join. Why? The, uh, all, of, all others are in their groups right now. I think, Prabhu, you were, you were not there in the last. Were you there in the last? Yeah. Group? No, I was not there. I was not there. Yeah, that's why. That's why it's not. Uh, Prabhu, we are out of our rooms in the back to the main group. I don't know why. Yeah, it started and everybody had joined that time. And uh, now I've cancelled the breakout room now, Maharaj, as you said. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, let everybody come back because everybody should be there. In, if some people can't get in the room, we can't do it. Yeah. Okay, so everyone's coming back to the main room? Yes, Maharaj, yeah. Okay. Yes, Maharaj, all are back. Okay, welcome back. Sorry about that. We have some problems to break out the rooms. Anyway, we'll just continue as we're doing. So text number 10 was describing the competition between the modes, that you can't just be in the mode of goodness, that sometimes you're going to be influenced by passion and ignorance. And we see that. Somebody who's really, you know, pretty good, pretty peaceful, the mode of goodness, but sometimes it gets really angry or sometimes it gets really lazy. <laughs> These kind of situations. So always some competition. Therefore, we have to transcend the modes. Text number 11 describes about how the mode of goodness is manifested. It describes about the gates of the body being illuminated by knowledge. Could, I, could anyone explain that to me? What does it mean the gates of the body are illuminated by knowledge? Hi Krishna Maharaj, so uh, this tells us about uh, the gates of the body, so eyes, nostrils, mouth, uh, uh, genitals, ha I think hands and legs, I'm not sure, yeah, no, so uh, if, we, if we have the knowledge then we will properly use uh, all this nine uh, gates of the body. So we will basically not misuse it according uh, like to people, those who are not in knowledge. Okay, very good, yes. I think that's a nice point, that we will know how to use it properly. Prabhupada writes in the purport, In the mode of goodness, one can see things in the right position. One can hear things in the right position. One can taste in the right position. Just like Mariji said, yeah. Very nice. So this is the, the one situated in the mode of goodness. He knows how to use everything in the proper way. But next verse goes on to describe an increase in the mode of passion. 
Sim the mode of passion means a lot of desire, a lot of activity, a lot of attachment. And Krishna describes great attachment, fruit of activity, intense endeavor, uncontrollable desire, and hankering develop. You can understand why our why Prabhupada said this whole planet is in the mode of passion. When we, especially when you go in Calcutta, a big city, and Prabhupada gives some examples here in the purport. He said, if he wants to construct a residential house, he tries his best to have a palatial house, as if he would be able to reside in that house eternally. And he develops a great hankering for sense gratification. He always wants to remain with his family and in his house and to continue the process of sense gratification. So this is the mode of passion. We have to understand how the mode of passion can influence us. And then going on to the mode of ignorance, text 13. The mode of when there's an increase in the mode of ignorance, Darkness, inertia, madness and illusion are manifested. It's often though people who are in these situations, they don't see it. They don't see it as being madness or illusion. They don't see how much they're influenced by the mode of ignorance. Going on, text 14. If someone dies in the mode of goodness, he attains the pure planet. Can someone give me an example? Death in the mode of goodness? Can you describe what what would be death in the mode of goodness? Yes? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Maharaj, maybe um, these people would go to Janaloka, Tapaloka, Meherloka or Swargaloka as per their karmas. Well, that's the destination, but I want to know how did they die in the mode of goodness? What was the particular circumstances of them leaving the body in the mode of goodness? You know, somebody dies... Somebody dies in the mode of passion, somebody dies in the mode of ignorance. What's it, how does it, what kind of circumstances, what situation will it be? Can Maharaj, you, I've seen some people die in their sleep only without any, going through any physical pain. That's the mode of ignorance. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Prabhupada said sleep is like death. Meditative state? What? Somebody somebody dies when they're meditating? Yes, Maharaj. Well, yeah, that's maybe tra that's a transcendental death. If they can leave the body while they're meditating, that is uh, that's very very elevated departure. That's transcendental maybe. Of course it depends on the object of their meditation. Oh, I'd like to hear from them, please. Hare Krishna. For example, a person, a, a Katriya who died in the battlefield because he's doing his prescribed duty as a Katriya. Yes, it's according to religious principles. I don't know if that's really the mode of goodness, but certainly it's according to religious principles and they do get a good destination. Usually they go to higher planets, right? Yes. Okay. Someone else? Hindu Lekha Mantri. Someone who leaves his body in the thumb. Okay. Very good. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very nice. Leave the body in the dham, that we should come to the dham, right? Leave the body. Prabhupada wanted that. In old age, people come and live in the dham and leave the body in the dham. That is very nice. Anything else? Dhananandu. Why are some people um, 
they uh, they leave their bodies in particular auspicious times like uttarayana something like that and some of them on some auspicious days like ekadashi vaikuntha ekadashi and so on and so forth yeah is that is this important for a devotee um i'm not sure but i've heard um at, at least for a devotee i heard there's one particular ekadashi called vaikuntha ekadashi but the, the based on the glory of that ekadashi when anybody who leaves their body on that particular ekadashi they go back to vaikuntha so um I think maybe my personal opinion, maybe yes, for some special ecology, it may be a nice for the devotee to leave the body. But uh, for the other thing, I'm not so sure. What does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 8th chapter? One who thinks of me while leaving the body, he attains uh, his, uh, his, his abode. Okay. Generally for a devotee, any time can leave the body. If they're devoted, right. if they're devoted their life, it doesn't matter whether it's auspicious or inauspicious. Even if they're not able to remember Krishna, if they've dedicated their life, if they leave the body unconscious, Krishna remembers them. Garuda Purana. Okay, some, some people go to Benares. The, Someone published a book, Death in Banaras, described about one Brahmana, he came with his whole family to Banaras to leave his body in Banaras. Hmm. Fasting, you know, first of all he was not, ate, not, not taking any grains and then he was just taking a little water and then he left the body. Death in the mode of goodness, right? What about death in the mode of passion? Some examples? Dada Prabhu, you also have something to say about mode of passion or it was your hand was raised before? I think what what was the example of death in the mode of passion? Like uh, any accidental death. Yes, a road accident maybe. Yeah. 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 That's like death in the mode of passion. People are fighting. Okay. What about the the man has a heart attack? He's in the stock market. <laughs> He's in the stock market and all the shares crash and he has a heart attack. <laughs> Something like that, you know. The business fails, he loses all his money, a heart attack. Maharaj, those who die in war are in mode of passion. Uh, maybe the mode of passion or ignorance. Somebody asked Prabhupada about uh, these people, he said, he, said it, 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 he asked Prabhupada, the Modi asked Prabhupada, do these people who die in wars, do they all get liberated because they're Kshatriyas, they're fighting on the battlefield? And Prabhupada said they go to hell, both sides. <laughs> he said they go to hell, both sides, because fighting for demonic purposes. Maharaj, uh, um, there was one devotee who was distributing books and he handed over Bhagavad Gita to one person and as soon as the person was holding Bhagavad Gita and he got heart attack and he died. So what would be the destination of that person? He would have gone to some uh, planet? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, you got to do a bit more than just hold Bhagavad Gita to go back to Godhead. Right? It's... 
Maharaj, in, in, in some places when the funeral pyre is being burnt, then you add Tulsi sticks. And, and it is it's like super auspicious to do that. And all his sins are eradicated when you burn Tulsi stick in a funeral pyre. So would the person in the next life get a better birth or would he directly go to Goloka or would he get a better circumstance to be a devotee? He would get better circumstance to be a devotee. There's no easy way or something that just when you're in a, when you're in a funeral pie, add some uh, auspicious articles of the Lord and stuff like that. Yeah, you're not going to go back to Godhead that easy. Mm -hmm. What about death in the mode of ignorance? That's an easy one. Maharaj, sorry, sorry to interrupt. In, in the Skanda Puran uh, of Nithulsi Mahatmya, it says that if anybody burns Tulsi stick in the funeral pyre, they go back to Vaikuntha. So if anybody uh, what? Is okay, but not they, if anybody burns a Tulsi stick in the funeral pyre, the person the dead person he goes to Vaikuntha. Uh, so Vaikuntha is more accessible than Goloka. <laughs> well of course you also have to be a pure heart. It's no material desires to go to Vaikuntha. You can't go to Vaikuntha if you have material desires. Then, then how, how do we understand um, some statements like this? Well, this just like in the scriptures, it says many things, but in some cases it's true. It's not true in every case. That point is stated in the Nectar of Devotion, that these different things, you know, that circumambulate Tulsi, you get freed of the reactions of killing a Brahmana and all these sometimes these things are true, but not it's not true in every case. Yes, Maharaj. But these statements are there to encourage people to do these things. Um, then, then where do we draw the line where we think that okay, this particular statement is really authoritative and we can follow this or or, or, or this is um, maybe not applicable for me right now or something. Uh, where do you draw the line there, Maharaj? Well, you have to be guided by Sadhu Shastra and Guru. Ask your Guru. He would draw the line. He would tell you. <laughs> hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Hmm? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Spiritual authorities. Maharaj, on that point, uh, previously I think we had discussed that Ajamil, Ajamil, at the end of his life, he recited the name of Lord, but he didn't immediately go back to Vaikuntha immediately. He was, again, he performed the austerity and then only. So, Prabhu's step can do. Yes, and then, right, he got reprieve, he got an extension. Then he went to Banaras, then he stayed in a temple. No, not Banaras, where did he go? Was it Banaras? Uh, uh, Rishikesh. Uh, Haridwar. 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 Haridwar, right. Haridwar, right. And he right, stayed in the temple there and, and, and then he gave up his body on the bank of the Ganga. And so like that, that's, that's a nice way to leave the body, on the Ganga. Leave the body in the Ganga, on the Ganga. So death in the mode of, mode of ignorance, an example. Death in the mode of ignorance? Um, that person who died in mode of ignorance, they died in a very fearful uh, situ uh, situation. So give me an example. Like, so I, like I have uh, heard or read somewhere, like how sometimes they, because of they are so fearful, they sometimes pass as stones and urine uh, while they are during the death. Oh, that's maybe the Yamaduras coming to take them. But what, what is it, what would be a good example? Somebody dies in the mode of ignorance? Maybe they're, they're drunk or they're intoxicated by drugs. That kind of thing. Death in the mode of ignorance. All right, so you die in the mode of goodness, you're, you're, where, what's your destination? Where do you go? We go to the, uh, like, uh, 
Higher planets are within a... Uh, right? You go to higher planets, you die in the mode of passion, what happens? I can't understand what you're saying. I'm not sure regarding dying mode of passion. All right, somebody else answer. So what does that mean? Where are where are, where are the fruit of workers? Someone else. That can also be uh, in Swarbhaloka. Can that be Maharaj? No. That's no. not fruit of workers. Somebody else answer. Death in the mode of passion. In the mode of passion. They take part in the early planet. Yes, they'll come back here. They'll come back here. This is the fruit of, this is where old passion is. This is the fruit of place. Everyone's very fruit of, they're all trying to enjoy. And people who die in the mode of ignorance, they'll go into the lower planets or they'll take birth in the animal kingdom. Right? So this is something to be aware of. All right, so going ahead. Uh, Text 16 and 17 are interrelated. Very interesting. Text 16. Action done in the mode of passion results in misery. People don't realize that. You know, they're thinking passion. Oh, it's so nice. I want some passion. I enjoy the passion. But the result of passion, misery. We should be... be Remember that and beware. And the result of mode, the mode of goodness? Purifying. And you get knowledge. Prabhupada says at the end of the purport here, in number 16, it says, uh, There may be a little so-called mental happiness. I have this house or this money, but this is not actual happiness. Well, it's not the end of the purple, I'm sorry, it's, <laughs> it's quite a big purple. This is not actual happiness. What is actual happiness? Then Prabhupada go, goes on in the purple, he talks about other problems, other very nasty things which are going on in the world animal slaughter, right, the killing of animals, the, the slaughtering poor animals is also due to the mode of ignorance. And then the killing of cows is most vicious because the cow gives milk, which is the most valuable food. So cow slaughter is an act of the grossest type of ignorance. So this is all going on in the world today. People are, the mode of ignorance is so strong. And then at the end of the purport, we do have a very powerful statement by Prabhupada. I'll just read it to you. In modern human society, spiritual knowledge is neglected and cow killing is encouraged. It is to be understood then that human society is advancing in the wrong direction and is clearing the path to its own condemnation. A civilization which guides the citizen to become animals in their next life is certainly not a human civilization. The present human civilization is, of course, no, grossly misled by the modes of passion and ignorance. It is a very dangerous age and all nations should take care to provide the easiest process, Krishna consciousness, 
to save humanity from the greatest danger. Everyone agree? Yes, Mother. Yes, Mother. Yes, Mother. All right, going ahead, take 17, someone read. For the more of goodness, real knowledge develops. From the more of patience, greed develops. And from the more of ignorance develops foolishness, madness, and illusion. In the purport, Prabhupada says, to stop this irresponsibility, Education for developing the mode of goodness of the people in general must be there. Right? You have to write your essay about cultivating the mode of goodness. How to get the mode of goodness, how to increase the mode of goodness in your life. People don't know. People don't know how to cultivate the mode of goodness. Our whole home, our home lifestyle is all based on passion and ignorance. The mode of goodness, oh, we think, oh, very boring. <laughs> People think very boring. They don't realize it's very purifying and you can experience real happiness. They're thinking the mode of passion is lively, exciting, but it all ends in misery, all ends in suffering. And Prabhupada then says in the purport, then people will be happy and prosperous. Even if a majority of the people aren't happy and prosperous, if a certain percentage of the population develop Krishna consciousness and become situated in the mode of goodness, then there is a possibility for peace and prosperity all over the world. Prabhupada said just a, a small percentage of the people, if they become Krishna conscious, it can change the face of the world. Do you believe it? Yes, Mahārāj. I hope so. I hope you have faith in the words of Śrīla Prabhupāda. Certain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then Prabhupada in the purple goes on, said, don't think just because you've got money, just because you've got material facilities that you're going to get peace of mind. He said, just these things are not going to give you real happiness. The mode of passion doesn't give you real happiness. You, you have all that money, you may have the position, the power, it doesn't give you peace of mind. We have to come to the mode of goodness by practicing Krishna consciousness. Uh, Burijan Prabhu, one of our senior devotees in Krishna consciousness movement, when he w was a young devotee, he was studying and he was hearing Prabhupada speak about the importance of cultivating the mode of goodness. So he asked Prabhupada, he said, you know Prabhupada, you're always saying we should come to the mode of goodness, but I thought we were supposed to transcend the mode of goodness. And Prabhupada said, yes, you're right. We do have to transcend the mode of goodness, but generally we have to maintain ourselves in the mode of goodness. Right? That is the transcendental position, when you can situate yourself firmly in the mode of goodness without any influence of passion and ignorance. Because so long as there's even a tinge of passion and ignorance, it can pull us down. So we have to come up to that position of pure goodness. All right, text 18 describes people situated in the mode of goodness, gradually go to higher planets, mode of passion, come back here, the mode of ignorance, go down to hell. Text 19. One can properly see the Supreme Lord in all activities. 
then he attains my spiritual nature. Okay, it's a, it's a benediction. And then text 20 describes, when you can transcend the modes of nature, then you can taste nectar. So coming up to the, the, the Arjuna's question, text 21, Arjuna has three questions, right? He wants to know, what are the symptoms of one who is transcendental to the three modes? And what is his behavior? Right? So there's a difference here. The, the first question, what, what, what is the symptoms? That means internal. What is the internal nature of such a person? And what is his behavior? That's talking about the external activities. And then, you, the third question, how does he transcend the modes of nature? So, text 23, 24, 25 are put together. They're describing, first of all, the symptoms and then the behavior. Right? The symptoms, the internal qualification. He does not hate illumin illumination, attachment and delusion when they are present or long for them. You can't tell these things. You can't see them immediately in a person. They're internal symptoms. But then what about the behavior? In the behavior described here, he looks upon a lump of earth, a stone and a piece of gold with an equal eye. He treats friend and enemy equally. So these are all, this is the behavior. So the first question was answered, the first part, and then second question. And then text 20, 26 comes up and we get how to transcend the modes of nature. Is that a memorization verse? Yes, Mahadev. Yes. Oh, okay. So we can read text 26. One who engages in, uh, devo in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. So is it an easy, is it an easy thing to come to the level of Brahman? It takes endeavor, Manoj. Yes. I think we have to endeavor because Krishna has qualified it. He said, unfailing in all circumstances. So we have to be constant. We have to be steady in our devotional service to come to that level of Brahman. It's not a small thing, right? In the purport, towards the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes here, I'll just read a little from Prabhupada's purport. If one is not situated in the same transcendental position with the Lord, one cannot serve the Supreme Lord. To be a personal assistant to a king, one must acquire the qualification. Thus, the qualification is to become Brahman or free from all material qualifications. It is said in the Vedic literature, Brahmaiva san Brahmapiyeti. One can attain the Supreme Brahman by becoming Brahman. This means that one must quali qualitatively become one with Brahman. All right? So we have to come to this platform. Of course, for devotees, coming to the platform of Brahman is not so, so bad. For the Mayavadis, it's a big challenge. For the impersonalists, their goal is to come to the Brahman. But for a devotee, Prabhupada would say devotional service begins on the platform of Brahman. But we want to go on from there. We don't want to just only be on the platform of Brahman. We want to go on to develop Krishna Prem, right? 
So devotional service begins on the platform of Brahman. That we will hear that also in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So coming to the platform of Brahman, uh, nice example Prabhupada gave about uh, this, to be the servant of the king, you have to acquire the qualifications. We want to serve Krishna, we want to serve the Supreme Lord, we have to also become like the Lord. We have to develop our, Brahm, Brahma, our, our consciousness of Brahman. Are there any questions on this? There's one more verse. We'll just read the final verse. And I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman, which is immortal, imperishable and eternal, and is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness. Right? So this is this very, you know, there are people the, the, the impersonalists, they will say when Krishna comes, he is the form of the Brahman, that he comes from the Brahman. And they say the Brahman is the Supreme. The impersonalist philosophers, they claim the Absolute is Brahman. But Krishna says here, he is the basis of the Brahman. They say the Brahman is the basis of Krishna. They change it, you see. Big difference. And what is the nature of that Brahman? Immortal, imperishable, it's eternal, like that. All right, we'll take questions. materialistic people here, they think that doing some uh, uh, charitable activity are in the mode of goodness. Is it in the mode of goodness or passion, Maharaj? I think it is in the mode of passion. Well, we'll see when we come to the uh, 17th chapter, 16th and 17th chapter, charity in the modes of nature will be described. So charity in the modes of nature is described there. If people do something for their own name and fame and to be known as a religious person, that's the mode of passion. But there's also charity in the mode of ignorance and there's also charity in the mode of goodness. Char charity in the mode of goodness should be done uh, where people do it without wanting any credit. And they will give it to a qualified person at a proper place, a proper time. Mm -hmm. yes. So then what will be the quality of uh, goodness marriage? So means what are the name, like uh, what is we can say as uh, qualities of goodness here? What we mean? For what? For charity? Not for charity marriage, any other like here we have the uh, discussed about the qualities of the goodness. All right. Yeah. So we we heard we heard the, the nature of people in the mode of goodness that they they have knowledge and they're they're happy mm -hmm. and the gates of their bodies are purified and they're enlightened. And so they will live. They will, the, the the mode of goodness the symbol of the mode of goodness is the brahmana. So what are the qualities of the Brahmana? That's also mentioned in 18th chapter. Nine qualities of the Brahmana. Peacefulness, self-control, austerity, purity, knowledge, wisdom, religiousness, these things. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is the Smriti. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj in text 2 it is said after acquiring perfect transcendental knowledge one acquires qualitative equality with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Maharaj we, uh, we have heard before that the Satchidanand Sarup that is qualitative we are like the Supreme Personality of Godhead and there is difference in quantity how do we understand this and is this same as the Brahman 
Now you're reading from the purport of text number 27 or 26. Maharaj, uh, my question was, I wanted to ask earlier also, text 2, when he says it requires qualitative equality with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Text 2? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, okay, let me go back and see. Sorry, Maharaj, I raised your hand before. And I just wanted to know now that they are saying that one has to be Brahman. Uh -huh. One can attain Supreme Brahman by becoming Brahman. Are these the same things? Having the qualitative equality and being Brahman? Is that the same thing, Maharaj? This is in the purport? The text 2, first line, purport. After acquiring perfect transcendental knowledge. Oh, all right. Yeah. One acquires qualitative equality with the Supreme personality of Godhead, becoming free from the repetition of birth and death. So your question is? Maharaj, my question is, we have heard before that qualitatively we are the same, such the, such an Sarup, but quantitatively we are different. Now, what does it mean by acquiring qualitative equality with the Lord? This is, or is there some other understanding to this? One acquires qualitative equality. Qualitative, I mean, we have the, the same qualities, just the spirit soul, the spirit soul has the same qualities as the, the spark of the fire has the same quality as the fire, heat and light. In quality, the same, but different in quantity. Right? Yes, yes. So the living entity is one in quality, but different in quantity with the Lord. So, so when one gets the, the perfect transcendental knowledge, then he feels all this, the Satchitanan uh, traits, then he feels all these, then he gets all these. This is what Prabhupada is trying to say here. Earlier we, we don't, uh, you know, realize the Satchitanan Sarup. So when one gets on the per perfect transcendental knowledge, then one realizes that. Is, is, is what Prabhupada is trying to say. Well, Prabhupada said, after acquiring perfect transcendental knowledge. So perfect transcendental knowledge means not just simply some, we've, we've not just simply memorized something or just simply read something, we've actually realized this knowledge. And this way then we will acquire the qualitative equality with the Supreme Lord. And this qualifies us to become free from the repetition of birth and death. And Prabhupada goes on to speak, we don't lose our identity, we remain an individual. Right? We're always individuals, we keep our individuality, but we're, we become uh, connected with the Lord through service. If one has perfect transcendental knowledge, then one will apply that knowledge to engage in the service of the Lord. And if you're getting free from birth and death, you're going to go to the kingdom of God. You're going to live with the Lord. What are you going to do there? You're going to be engaged in service. So certainly you have such the Nanda Swarup. The spiritual body is all. All the spiritual bodies are such a Tananda. And now, and in text 26, it is said that to become, to, uh, to about the Brahman, one can attain Supreme Brahman by becoming Brahman. And you said by Brahman, it means immoral, imperishable and eternal. That is when one attains, when the living entity attains the spiritual world, then does it mean that? Uh, yeah, certainly, the, the nature of the soul is Brahman. The soul's nature in this world is also Brahman. It maintains its spiritual nature both here in this world and in the spiritual world. Right? We say for the soul there's no birth and death. It's immortal, immortal imperishable, eternal. Yes. So that's the nature of the soul. Whether it's here in this world, conditioned soul or material, or liberated soul. Nitya Bada or Nitya Siddha, the soul's nature is always like that. But in material world, we have the material body, the soul is encased in the material body. 
but the soul's nature is Brahman. And we want to transcend the modes of nature, we, should, we want to re come to that platform of Brahman. Coming to the platform of Brahman, by engaging, one who engages in my devotion, who transcends the modes of nature, comes to the level of Brahman. Comes to the level of Brahman in the sense that he understands everything is Krishna, belongs to Krishna, it's for Krishna's service. The platform of Brahman, we realize we're not the body, we realize we're so living in the body. And the nature of the body is, the nature of the soul is Brahman. So this is Brahman realization. Yes, Father. And we heard also, everything is Brahman. The material world, the manifestation, it's all Brahman. It all comes from Krishna. So in that sense, you could say it's all Brahman. Prakriti. Prakriti is also Brahman. It's Krishna's nature. So it's also Brahman. The Mayavadis, they say, Sarvam Kauvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. This is, Bra this is the, con the platform of Brahman. But yes, people who come to the platform of Brahman, they may not understand the importance of devotional service. Just like the impersonalists, the Mayavadis, their goal is to come to the platform of Brahman, but they simply think, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am Brahman. But they don't know that they are Krishna's servant. They don't engage in any activity. So on the platform of Brahman, there, will be, there may be no activity. There's nothing to do. They, and sometimes they think everything is just one, and they do nothing. So that's the platform of Brahman, the oneness. But our understanding is we're Brahman, and we're serving the Supreme Brahman. We're using the, the we're using the the everything in the service of the supreme Brahman, Krishna. So there's a difference: the tiny sparks of the Brahman and the supreme Brahman. We don't just want to stay on the platform of Brahman, but we do want to. We do have to transcend the material nature, and in order to transcend the material nature. We have to realize that we are not the body, that we are sparks of the Supreme Brahman, that we are Brahman. Is it clearer for you now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Maharaj, there are three devotees. All right, let's take them. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, in this verse number 27, uh, Krishna says that uh, I am the basis of impersonal Brahman which is immortal, imperishable and eternal and is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness. But uh, we, what we learned was that Brahman means it's like eternity. There's no uh, thing of happiness. No, there is happiness. happiness. But there is happiness there. There is happiness, but it's only a, a drop compared to the ocean of happiness in devotional service. But there is some tiny spark of happiness there in the, on the platform of Brahman. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, you were discussing about Gurujan Prabhu's example, how Prabhupada told to come to uh, mode of goodness uh, to transcend uh, to come to Shuddha Sattva but I is it not possible to come to Shuddha Sattva like transcendental mode transcend the mode from any other mode also Maharaj by engaging in service like he need not be he need not be in mode of goodness he might be a passionate person but he's engaging in devotional service is that considered uh, well you have you have to understand you know, if we're in the mode of passion or ignorance, it's a long way up. It's a long way up to transcend. 
you've got to you've got to really work hard now we do see you know of course Prabhupada movement Prabhupada began the movement in the west and of course a lot of devotees there you know we're coming from the mode of passion and ignorance we come from the mode of passion and ignorance into Krishna consciousness so it's not that we you know, we do, we do make an attempt to come to that transcendental platform, but we, we have, in order to maintain, to, to, as, just like Krishna says, without falling down, you engage in devotional service without falling down, you have to really, you have to really endeavor to get free of the passion and the ignorance, the conditioning which is remaining. It's not an easy thing to get rid of all the passion and ignorance which we've accumulated over many lifetimes in the material world. So we have that conditioning, we come to Krishna consciousness and we do just simply engage in devotional service and devotional service is transcendental. But how much are we able to absorb ourselves in devotional service? That's it, the problem, that we have, we have uh, conditioning there. Conditioning, sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't go to Mongol Arti, sometimes, sometimes you, you get lazy and angry and quarrel. And Prabhupada had all these problems to deal with, devotees who were with him. You know, the quarreling, the arguing, the fighting which would go on, which were really just passion and ignorance. And so, to, to really transcend these things, you have to come, you will have to get up to the mode of goodness, to get rid of the passion and ignorance. So, cultivation of the mode of goodness is a very important point in developing pure devotional service. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Maharaj, next is Gadadhar. Thank you, Sir Maharaj. Uh, we used to heard about the terminology that it's called Brahmananda. So, what is the really meaning of Brahmananda, Maharaj? What is the meaning of Brahman? Brahmananda. Brahmananda. Brahmananda is a universe. General, we speak of Brahmananda as a, a universe. It's not related to any Ananda getting in the Brahman, Brahman state, is that Well, I said there is some happiness in the Brahman. There's, happy, there's no misery. Certainly there's no distress. There's no lamentation on the platform of Brahman. But the happiness which is there is very insignificant compared to the happiness of devotional service. Right? The happiness of coming to the platform of Brahman, that's, oh, I'm liberated, I'm free from the material world, yeah, no miseries. But, there's, remember, on the platform of Brahman, there's no relationship, there's no variety, there's only the oneness. So the happiness is very limited. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, another devotee has typed a uh, I mean, question in the chat box. Uh -huh. uh, that's Muli Govind Prabhu. Muli Govind Prabhu is asking, Maharaj, please enlighten whether ISKCON devotees need to cross even sattva guna more to realize the absolute truth? Well, of course, to realize the absolute truth, we have to transcend the modes of nature. It means we have to come to the stage of Vishuddha sattva, pure goodness. Pure goodness means no trace of passion and ignorance. Without coming to that stage, then we cannot realize the absolute truth. Because we heard, we heard you have to be like Brahman to serve the Supreme Brahman. You have to be Brahman, you have to come to that stage of Brahman. So on the platform of Brahman, there's no passion or ignorance. Yes? Okay, 
शशिनंदन प्रभु So we'll finish here today. So thank you very so thank you very much. We'll go on tomorrow, chapter fifteen. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Brinda Ki.